Hello very much. Thank you very much, rather, for having me. The, um, what is innovation? We're going to be talking about innovation. And what actually is it? There are two sides. You have creativity, as Stephen Jobs said, creativity that's shipped. So we have two sides. I want to focus on creativity, and as a neuroscience, they've asked me to spend 15 minutes telling you how the brain creates. So that's a big task, instead of a different aim, which is, at the end, I want you to know less than you think you know now. Okay? And what is that I want you to know less about? It's about the process of creativity itself. So what is actually at the heart of creativity? It's perception. Now, perception underpins every single thing we think, we believe, we know. The clothes we wear, the people we fall in love with, our hopes, everything begins with perception. Creativity begins with perception. So to understand how and why we perceive is not only understand how we create, but who we are as people. So when I open my eyes, what do we actually see? So how many here think that you actually see the world as it really is? <laughs> One, two, three. We have three literalists in the room, right? What are you actually seeing if not the world as it really is? Do I not exist? Do the chairs not exist? What are you seeing? No one, right? Let's do an example. Here we have four squares. They're increasing in intensity. Right? The one on the left is the darkest, the one on the light is releasing the most amount of light, and it seems as if they're increasing the brightness. So it's as if you're seeing the world as it really is. Right? Things that are different look different, which means that if I have two things that are exactly the same, they should also look the same, always. So these two squares are exactly the same in physical terms, and they look the same. So it's as if we are seeing the world as it really is. But we have a problem. It seems we have a problem. If I just change their context, I change what surrounds them, suddenly your perception changes. So those two squares physically haven't changed, but your perception of them has. So the one in the dark surround now looks lighter than the one in the light surround. So that's your perceptual reality. Okay? Now remember, we're just talking about lightness here. This is the simplest thing that your brain does, seeing light. Even jellyfish see light, and they don't have brains. Right? And even at this level, context is everything. So if we could understand not just that context is everything, but why, we'd actually understand what it is to be human. And we don't know why we see that, or rather we don't know how we see that brightness contrast illusion. But I want to suggest why we see it. The answer has to do with the fact that we have no direct access to our physical world. So this goes back to Berkeley or Berkeley, depending on where you come from. Okay? And what do I mean by that? Imagine this is the back of your eye, and these are two projections from the physical world that are falling onto the back of the eye. They're identical in every single way. They're identical in shape, spectral quality. Everything about them is the same. So as far as your eyes are concerned, they're the same. Now, this is the only information your brain gets. Okay? So it should be that your brain says, ah, these are the same. And yet, they come from completely different sources in the world. The one on the left comes from an orange surface, under direct light, oriented this way, viewed through some blue medium. The one on the right comes from a yellow surface, in shadow, oriented exactly the opposite direction, viewed through a pink medium. Completely different sources, requiring completely different behaviors, giving rise to the exact same information. Now, this is one reason why your eyes have actually very little to do with seeing. Only 10% of the information your brain uses to see comes from your eyes. The other 90% comes in the other parts of your brain. So, why is this? Imagine your eyes are here, and this stimulus is the information that your eyes are receiving. That information is made up of three different attributes of the world. The color of illumination, the color of the objects, and the color of space between you and objects. You vary any one of those things, and you'll vary the information that your eyes get. Now remember, that information is the only information your brain gets. So if you remember anything, remember this. Information, data, while useful, is meaningless. It is literally meaningless. 
even at the level of lightness. Why? Because it could literally mean anything. It could mean a bright surface in a dark light or a dark surface in a bright light. Right? So if this is true, how is it that the brain actually even sees? How can we see anything if the information we're getting is meaningless? The brain does two things. First, it finds patterns in information. It's essentially using statistics right, to more efficiently, in a sense, encode that information. But that by itself doesn't tell it what to do. It then has to associate that information with a meaning. Right? That meaning of relationships, of what this meant for behavior in the past. That's what your brain's constantly doing. It's constantly redefining normality according to the statistics of information, but more importantly, what that information meant. Right? So let's just play a game to show what I mean. And we know this to be true in the context of language. And so we have a very simple task. Read what you see. Okay, and we're going to do it all together. So one, two, three. Very good. One, two, three. Okay, good. One, two, three. If you're a Portuguese, right? One, two, three. Okay, so remember what the task was. Read what you see. So you all failed. There are no words there. That literally says, what are you reading? Right? That does not say, what are you reading? Why did you read it that way? Because in the history of your experience, you've actually encoded the statistics of co-occurring letters in the English language. So when your brain sees a W space A, it puts an H there. Why? Because it would have been useful to do so in the past. So it does so again. But there's no a priori reason why it needs to do that. And notice none of you read, what are you dreaming? Which is just as likely. Why? Because I had you reading, and so you read, what are you reading? Okay? So what this means is that we can actually get you to see things completely differently by changing the meaning of information. And remember, we're just talking about lightness and color here. So here we have two identical squares. If I don't change those squares at all, but I change their meaning, see what happens to your perception. The tile at the top looks dark brown, and the tile at the side looks light orange. Why? Because the meaning of those tiles has changed. If the one on the side were actually in shadow, there would be less light hitting it. In order to reflect the same amount of light to your eye as the one at the top, it actually has to be more reflective. So you see it that way, because it would have been useful to do so in the past. We'll do one more, where you have four identical gray tiles on the left, seven identical gray tiles on the right. Okay? Agreed? They're all the same. Keep your eye on the one in the front there. And again, I'm not going to change it physically. I'm just going to change its meaning by changing its context. Do you see four blue tiles on the left? Yes? And you see seven yellow tiles on the right? Yes? They're all exactly the same. They're all gray. That's your perceptual reality. The one before was your physical reality. Okay? These two tables are the same. The one on the right is just simply the one on the left on its side. The dimensions of the tables are the same. But they have different meanings, so you see them as different. Okay? So what is it that we see when we open our eyes? We don't see, what the, we don't see the reality that's in front of us. We don't see the information that falls onto our eyes. Rather, we see what was useful to see in the past. Okay? Which means when it comes to perception, we're very much like this frog. Literally, not metaphorically. <laughs> it's getting a stimulus. It's generating a behavior that would have been useful in the past. And when things don't go quite our way, we get a bit annoyed, just like the frog, right? So now some of you are thinking, no, I've got free will. I'm not like that frog. So let's do another test. I'm going to give you two shapes. You've never seen these shapes before. These shapes don't have names, agreed? They're not triangles or squares or circles, right? But now I'm going to give you two sounds. 
sounds you've also not heard before. The first one is kiki. The second one is boo-boo. Now, you incredibly independent, free-thinking people have a simple task. Which one of these shapes is kiki and which one is boo-boo? Now remember, be independent. <laughs> be creative. How many of you say the one on the left is kiki? Except for the contrarians. How many of you uh, think boo-boo's on the right? Right? I won't go into why that is the case. This is the basis, basis of metaphor. How the brain uses metaphor to explore new spaces. Right? Point is, we're so grounded in our history, we find it incredibly difficult to see anything differently. So well, tell us why. why? I will, I've only got like two minutes left. Okay. <laughs> I've got to do the whole brain. And, okay. So, all new perceptions begin the same way, with a question. Right? That's how perceptions begin. Right? The problem is perceptions create uncertainty, and we hate uncertainty. If you're not sure that's a predator, it's too late. Right? We've evolved to take what's uncertain and make it certain. That's what the brain does. Dealing with uncertainty is the fundamental challenge of the brain. Seasickness is a consequence of uncertainty. Okay? We literally hate it. And yet, the best questions, the things that challenge our most core assumptions, the things that create the most uncertainty are the best. Right? That's where we get the biggest paradigm shifts, where we challenge our assumptions of who we are. Okay? And what are the assumptions that are most difficult to see, most difficult to challenge? It's the ones we inherit, not the ones we created. In fact, it can be so difficult to actually There's see. This pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless and I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there... Stop you know, trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing... You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. See, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I'm gonna listen. Fine. Fortunately, evolution has given us an answer that enables us to actually deal with uncertainty. Okay? And it's not technology. Right? Which I know is maybe a difficult thing to say here in this audience. Right? That is not the greatest innovation, greatest future innovation. It is not technology. It's not what evolution gave us to deal with uncertainty. It's a way of being. What is that way of being? We can think about it in the context of science. But science may be not as you thought about it. Science is not the method section of a paper. Science is a way of being. What is that way of being? It celebrates uncertainty. It's open to diversity. Right? Groups enable us to challenge our assumptions. It's open to possibility. It's cooperative, inherently so. And it's one of the only human behaviors that is intrinsically motivating. We do it in order to do it. For those experts, in science, like Isabel Banke and others, that is also what we call play. Right? Play is nature's solution to deal with uncertainty. So, to conclude, excuse me, to, to conclude then, I want to suggest that the next greatest innovation is again not technology, it's not about information, it's not about efficiency, businesses and education focus on answers because it enables us to do processes very efficiently. Suggest the next greatest innovation is a way of being that enables us to see ourselves and the world differently. That is at the heart of creativity. Okay? So thank you very much.